Welcome to the Stanford Medicine Alumni Association's Half Century Club celebration. My name is Jennifer Cobble and I'm the Executive Director of SMAA. We're sorry we can't meet you all in person this year. We were so looking forward to it, but we're still excited to welcome those of you who are joining us virtually from all over the country. Today, we'll celebrate your connection to Stanford School of Medicine and our broader Stanford alumni community. In a moment, we'll hear from our guest speaker, Dr. Robert Harrington, and have time for some questions and answers. Then, based on your request from last year, we'll also be providing some time at the end of this hour to have you join us for an informal mixer and conversation with your fellow alumni. Before you begin, I would like to recommend that you um, remind you that your microphones and your visual profiles have been set to listen only. So right now you can't see your, your fellow classmates and um, you won't be able to, to talk. The reason we take your, your microphones off is sometimes we hear Fido in the background or uh, someone is talking and we wanna make sure that everyone can hear the speaker. Um, so you will only see the speaker or the moderator on your screen um, over the next hour. Should you encounter technical difficulties please try leaving the webinar and logging back in again. And if issues persist, you can reach out to us at med at stanford, med alumni at stanford.edu or just place a message um, uh, to us in the, in the Q&A column and uh, we'll try to respond to you. Finally, we'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question anytime during the presentation by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you scroll down, you'll see um, on the bottom bar, something that says Q&A. When you click on that, it'll open up a screen and you can type in your question. Um, do not use, uh, try to use the chat feature um, for submitting questions and also um, if you like a particular question, you can just click a thumbs up uh, icon and that question will move up in the priorities for us to um, bring that up to the question sooner. I'm sorry that we can't always ensure that all questions will be answered because of our time constraints, but I'm sure that we will um, be pleased with the information that we can provide and we welcome your interaction by submitting those questions along the way. Now I'm pleased to introduce our Stanford Medicine Alumni Association Board of Governors President. He's a graduate of the medical school class of 1975. Val Van Dalsum has a long engagement with Stanford University, having received his bachelor's in biology in 1971 and followed by his MD degree in 1975. He completed his internship residency and fellowship in diagnostic radiology at the University of California, San Francisco in 1980, where he continues to serve on the Diagnostic Radiology Margolis Society Board of Directors. Dr. Van Delsum practiced diagnostic radiology at El Camino Hospital in Mountain View, California from 1980 to 2007, and has served as the medical director of the radiologic technology and diagnostic medical sonogram training programs at the local Foothill College since 1991. In 2007, he returned to Stanford by joining the Stanford Medical School as an associate press professor of clinical education and a faculty member. He is um, the clinical educator faculty member for um, outpatient imagery and uh, at the Stanford Hospitals and Clinics and a co-chair of the Outpatient Imagery and Community Radiology Department. He was appointed Professor of Abdominal Imaging in the Stanford Department of Diagnostic Radiology in 2012. Paul has been a member of the Board of Governors of the Stanford Medicine Alumni Association since 2014 and is currently president of the association. Please welcome Dr. Val Van Delsum. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I apologize for the, um, uh, to Bob in advance, Dr. Harrington, because 
my introduction was much longer than uh, yours is going to be. Uh, it would go on for days if I was to list all of your accomplishments. So uh, I've, uh, I've tried to kind of keep it short for brevity. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Stanford Medicine Alumni Association Half Century Club virtual celebration. Um, I wish I, to the magic of Zoom, I'm, it appears that I'm up at Lake Tahoe, but not the case uh, in, the, in the Bay Area, Los Altos Hills. Uh, not a bad spot to be, but certainly not Tahoe. Um, this event is a special afternoon designed to gather colleagues and friends across multiple graduation years that have a 50 plus year connection with Stanford Medicine. It provides an opportunity to celebrate with fellow alumni, as well as to provide information about current programs and activities at the School of Medicine and Stanford University. Uh, due to the code pandemic, we are unable to meet in person. That's necessitating this Zoom conference, but hopefully we will all be able to reconvene in person in 2023. Um, my, uh, I'm privileged to announce those attendees who are logging in from the greatest distance. That would be Jay Older, class of 66 from Florida and Norm Rich, class of 60 from Maryland. Um, I also would like to recognize the uh, members of the um, oldest uh, uh, classes represented, Thomas Leo, class of 48, um, Gordon Vosti, a former partner of my dad's and a family friend. Gordon, I hope you're out there. I hope you are well. Uh, and um, a, a handful of people from the class of 55. Unfortunately, I don't have their names. Um, it's now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Harrington, who's the Arthur L. Bloomfield Professor of Medicine and Chair of the Department of Medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Harrington is an interventional cardiologist, a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, a recent member of the ACC Board of Trustees, and is currently a member of the American Heart Association's Board of Directors and its recent past president. And again, we would be about 1230 if I was uh, um, went through the rest of, of Bob's accomplishments. Um, most importantly, he is a true son of New England, born and raised in Boston, I just learned. He attended Holy Cross, go Crusaders. Um, Dartmouth Medical School, received his MD from Tufts, completed his internal medicine training at the University of Massachusetts Med Center, and then completed his cardiology training at Duke before we persuaded him to come west to Stanford. So, uh, and just go, go Sox, Bob. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Harrington to the Half Century Club. Well, thank you uh, so much for having me. Thank you, Jennifer, for the invitation. And it really is a privilege to be able to talk to the, um, to the Half Century Club. Uh, what I'm gonna try to walk us through today is a little bit of what I'll call the future of cardiology or a heartfelt future. And what, what I'm going to try to cover three broad topics, and we'll uh, hopefully have some good questions that we can discuss at the end. The first is that let me try to give you some perspective on what we'll call heart statistics, where what is the state of, uh, of heart disease now in the United States, and what are some of the key issues? Um, as, Val, as Val said, I'm a recent past president of the American Heart Association. I was actually the president during the, uh, the beginning of the pandemic. I was a president from 2019 to 2020. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the key contemporary issues from the perspective of the Heart Association. The Heart Association has 40 million volunteers and it has another 40,000 science volunteers. And uh, it was a privilege to lead the organization for the year. Um, and I'm gonna give you some of the perspective on American cardiology from that lens. And then I'm gonna close and uh, knowing that we all have uh, a love for Stanford and try to let you know a little bit of what's the science that's going on and what are some of the exciting new advances that are going on here at Stanford. I'll try to particularly highlight some of the work of our more junior faculty so that you can see the, uh, the real excitement in what they're doing and, uh, and how they hope to change the, uh, the future of cardiovascular medicine. Every year, the Heart Association puts out a report called the Heart Disease and Stroke Statistics. This is the 2022 version that just came out. If any of you are interested, just Google Heart Disease and Stroke Statistics 2022 update. You can get slides, you can get PDFs. Uh, if you really wanna do a deeper dive into the sort of the state of the state of cardiovascular disease and stroke in the United States. But let's put some uh, starting points of data out there so that we're all thinking about the magnitude of cardiovascular disease. So if we look at the US 
death rate, and this is the age-adjusted death rate attributable to cardiovascular disease, is almost 215 persons per 100,000 persons. This makes it by far the leading cause of death and actually the leading cause of disability in the United States. On average, someone dies of cardiovascular disease every half minute, which is really extraordinary. Over 2,300 deaths a day. Someone has a stroke every 40 seconds and there's approximately almost 800,000 new recurrent strokes a day. So we're talking about a really big public health issue. If we look at some of the components of heart disease, like high blood pressure, hypertension, almost half of us in the US have hypertension. And if you get over the age of 65, close to 70% of us have hypertension. Only about one in four of us achieves adequate leisure time, aerobic and muscle strengthening activities. Uh, the, the, the U.S. Surgeon General, as well as the Heart Association, has defined this as 30 minutes of moderate exercise, typically defined as a, a brisk walk five times a week. Only about a quarter of us actually get that level of exercise. Here's a piece of good news. We have made tremendous progress over the years that you all have graduated from medical school. We're now down to about one in seven men and one in eight women who are cigarette smokers. And if you think about this in the 60s, we had about half the adult population was smoking. But here's some not so good news uh, that over the course of the last five to seven years, we've seen an epidemic of e-cigarette use, vaping, uh, amongst our uh, amongst our youth, and if you look in high school, uh, almost twenty percent of high school students have used uh, an e-cigarette or a vaping product in the last thirty days. A huge public health concern for the years ahead. Here's some mixed news: that while we saw over the course of the 1900s the <clears throat> risk attributable to cardiovascular disease rise uh, and peak in the early to late 1960s and then saw a steady decline of deaths from cardiovascular disease. This was all good. This was public health. This was the US Surgeon General report on smoking. This was the recognition of cholesterol as a risk factor. This was the recognition of hypertension as a risk factor and attention paid to lowering blood pressure across the population. And then about 2015, something very disturbing and bothersome happened. We saw a plateauing and then a gradual increase again in, uh, in deaths attributed to cardiovascular disease. We're starting to see a slowing of that again, but a lot of that is due to inadequate treatment for large segments of our population, largely underrepresented, uh, underrepresented groups, largely groups who don't have access to, uh, to good health care, access to good care. And I'm going to show you some of those statistics. But we certainly, what this points out is that we need to redouble our efforts to uh, continue that decline in death from cardiovascular disease. Well, as you all know, cardiovascular disease is a large, broad term. It conveys um, deaths from ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, deaths from heart failure, deaths from arrhythmias, deaths from stroke. Uh, but the dominant form of cardiovascular death, and in fact, the dominant form of cardiovascular disability is coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease. Interesting, if you take the global perspective, that ischemic heart disease is now the leading cause of death in every area of the globe, with the exception of sub-Sahara Africa. Think about that, ischemic heart disease, which in many areas of the globe had never been seen until a few decades ago, is now the leading cause of death everywhere except for sub-Sahara Africa. It trumps infectious diseases, it trumps accidents and, uh, and uh, infectious disease, cancer. Um, and it really tells us that this is a global disease that largely is a disease that can be controlled. It's largely a disease attributable to poor diet, lack of exercise, uncontrolled blood pressure, uncontrolled glucose, uncontrolled cholesterol, tobacco use, uh, and we can do better. And we can really redouble our efforts, particularly with regard to uh, our public health measures. And I'll talk about that. I made the comment that um, one of the reasons we see a plateauing of deaths and then maybe even a gradual increase in deaths attributed to cardiovascular disease is because of data that you see here. 
we have extreme health inequities in this country, um, and that really does play out in cardiovascular uh, in cardiovascular disease. Black adults are almost 33% more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than non-Hispanic whites. I mean, that's extraordinary. And we see the same with, um, with American Indians, with Hispanics, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islanders. This is really a disease that does not treat all people the same. Uh, and some of the key issues have to do with things that we now know are important social determinants of health. Um, yes, we're concerned about access to care, but we're also concerned about health behaviors. We're concerned about the physical environment. Does somebody have adequate access to clean air? And I'll talk about that when I talk about Stanford a little later today. Um, do people have employment that offers them health insurance? Do they make enough income to pay for out-of-pocket testing, out-of-pocket medications? So all of this wrapped together, coupled with what I'll call the traditional risk factors, is why we continue to see an increased risk of dying from cardiovascular disease in this country. If you look at the numbers, they're staggering when we talk about some of the social determinants of health. 26 million of us live without access to healthy foods. That means people are living in areas where they don't have regular access to fresh fruit and vegetables, where they only have access to processed foods, where they only have access to fast foods. This is the so-called food deserts that you hear, uh, particularly in the inner cities, but not confined to the inner cities. You think of rural America as agricultural hubs, but the way that the rural America is changing, we now see our colleague, our fellow citizens living in rural America who don't have adequate access to fresh fruits and vegetables, healthy foods. So how does this play out? So if you think about things like uh, body mass index, obesity, if you think about things like tobacco, dietary issues, high blood sugar, high blood pressure, and then you look at that across the country, they're not evenly distributed. We're fortunate here, many of us on the call live in Northern California where we have an extremely healthy population, a population that does have access to outdoor activities that, for exercise, that does have access uh, to, uh, to great foods. Um, and what you see that play out is in the health of the population. If you look at those types of things across the country, you can see that they're not evenly distributed. And because of that, we have some extreme examples here where life expectancy for adults, healthy life is about 70 in Hawaii versus 62 in West Virginia. Healthy life refers to this notion that you aggregate not just your number of years, but how many of those years are full of good health. Uh, of good health. So the example that I usually use is that somebody has a stroke at 50 and they live to 70 the health adjusted life expectancy is actually 50. If you look at someone who had a stroke at 69 and lived to, to, um, to 70, they actually have 69 healthy years of life. So an interesting way to, uh, to look at those kind of statistics. I'll leave you with one more statistic, which I think is also a bit, um, both a bit scary and a bit humbling because we don't know how this is all gonna play out yet. This is a paper that just appeared in Nature Medicine last week, which looked at the long-term cardiovascular outcomes of COVID-19. I'll remind you that when the pandemic started, we were very concerned about the disease really seeming to disproportionately affect those people with cardiovascular disease. We saw reports coming out of Italy and China where people with hypertension and diabetes and metabolic syndrome seem to be not just at higher risk of getting COVID, but also from getting sick from COVID, and in many cases, dying from COVID. And we didn't know if this was because of drugs like the ACE inhibitors actually might facilitate the entry of the virus directly into cells via the ACE2 receptor. Well, that was quickly studied and shown not to be the issue, but there still remained this association between cardiovascular uh, risk factors and, um, and illness and death from COVID. We then saw a very disturbing phenomenon that in the early days of the pandemic, when we weren't sure how much PPE did you need to wear, um, could you actually touch surfaces in a room where a patient with uh, COVID was? What was going to be all of those long-term issues well, people got scared 
And because of that, we started to see people not come to the hospital, including not come to Stanford because they were afraid to be in the emergency room with patients who might be infected with COVID. So people who were having heart attacks, malconfarction, stayed home. They then showed up late in their doctor's office with complications of myocarditis that we had not seen in 15 to 20 years. Things like papillary muscle rupture and mitral regurgitation, things like ventricular septal rupture uh, because of a large anterior myocarditis. So we were seeing these complications that we, the surgeons, hadn't seen in years since we began a very aggressive approach to reperfusion in the setting of myocarditis. American Heart Association, we actually launched a big campaign called Don't Die of Doubt. Don't stay home if you have cardiac symptoms. Get to the hospital. Well, that's part of this story here of the late complications. But there's also some other issues of COVID, uh, heightened inflammatory response that may lead to myocarditis or inflammation of the heart. And so this is all going to play out over the next five to 10 years. We don't know how much of it is COVID affecting uh, people's decision making. And we don't know how much of it is COVID actually affecting the heart directly, but there'll be a lot more to come in this in the, uh, in the coming years. Now let's talk a little bit about Stanford. I know you're all proud Stanford alums, uh, and that's why exactly why you're joining us today. And let me share with you some of the really incredible stuff that particularly some of our young people here at Stanford are doing, which I think gives you a glimpse for the future, because our young people are definitely using new techniques, new technologies to try to understand where cardiovascular medicine might be going. This is uh, Vicki Parikh. Vicki is, a, uh, is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine. She's also a member of the Center for Inherited Cardiovascular Disease. This is an area led by you and Ashley, where we're trying to figure out what are some of the inherited abnormalities of things like rhythm disorders that might lead to sudden cardiac death? What are some of the inherited disorders of lipid metabolism that might lead to accelerated atherosclerosis? What are some of the inherited cardiomyopathies that might lead to heart failure and sudden cardiac death. And Vicki's really working at the intersection of trying to understand inherited cardiomyopathies and inherited arrhythmic risks. And so she's using a lot of um, very state-of-the-art technologies to try to understand that. So keep a listen out and a, and a look out for her because she's gonna do some amazing things. In a similar way, Han Zhu, who's an instructor, meaning just out of her fellowship training, she's already one of the leaders at Stanford and by extension nationally into this brand new area of cardiology called cardio-oncology. Turns out that a lot of these exciting new drugs that we're using in oncology, things like the immune checkpoint inhibitors, actually may have a direct toxic effect on the heart. And sometimes the inflammatory state that's induced by treatment with some of these um, novel uh, uh, anti-cancer medicines are also affecting the heart directly. Han Zhu and her team are beginning to try to understand the issue of myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, and try to understand who's gonna get it. Do you, do you have to stop the cancer therapy? Do you have to adapt the cancer therapy? And what kind of complications do we have to be aware of? I recently took care of a patient in collaboration with Han Zhu uh, who had extensive myocarditis and had refractory ventricular tachycardia uh, because of his, uh, his myocarditis from an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So these are really important concepts. This is going to be a big area of cardiology, given the increasing burden of cancer, given the really um, accelerated uh, role of some of these new immune modulators for the treatment of cancer. How do we figure out how to give patients these drugs safely in the setting of potentially heart disease. Well, I suspect some of you on the uh, phone here know of our colleague, Joe Wu, who runs the Cardiovascular Institute here at Stanford. So here now I'm deviating a little bit from my focus on the young uh, to really highlight, I think, one of Stanford's truly great scientists, Joe Wu. Uh, Joe is now been studying for years um, stem cells. And he's been creating stem cells uh, in his laboratory. He takes things like a, a piece of muscle, de-differentiates it back to a stem cell, and then using other techniques can differentiate it into 
any cell type you want in the body, he's growing organs. He's showing us how you can potentially restore myocardial function in a group of patients with heart failure. And so this is one of the first trials that's being done in the US funded by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. So those of you who live in California, your tax dollars are going towards funding the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. And hopefully we're gonna put some of those dollars to good use here at Stanford and trying to figure out, can we regenerate the heart in people who have suffered heart damage? So really exciting work by Joe. I'd mentioned the whole notion earlier of air quality as being potentially a social determinant of health. And certainly we know that there's areas of the Central Valley, for example, where there's really high levels of, uh, of air, of poor air quality. Well, Brian Kim, one of our new assistant professors of medicine is really interested in trying to understand cardiovascular risk from environmental exposure. And he's working with people like Carrie Nadeau who have had longstanding programs in the Central Valley to understand allergy and asthma. Now, Brian's trying to understand what about the effects of air quality on things like atherosclerosis, on things like coronary artery disease, on things like the risk of myocardial infarction. So this is really trying to combine public health perspective with clinical science to try to understand, for example, how we using science might influence public policy around air quality. Also a topic that all of the global societies of cardiovascular medicine are very interested in is this is a, uh, a major issue for the globe. I could have shown you many of our sections in, uh, in cardiovascular medicine. This is just our section in uh, preventive cardiology led by uh, the gentleman in the top row there with the red tie, David Marin. Uh, some of you may have seen David Marin over the years. He's also a, a proud Stanford alum uh, where he was a volleyball player here at uh, Stanford many years ago. And David is our section chief for uh, preventive cardiology. This is the group that tries to prevent disease before it happens or tries to prevent a second event from happening once somebody say has a heart attack. And they are involved with an amazing collection of, of projects here, doing everything from trying to redefine risk in a project called Project Baseline, which is really updating the Framingham knowledge of the, uh, of the 20th century, new drugs using home monitoring devices, and also really taking advantage during the pandemic of the fact that with preventive cardiology, virtual medicine works incredibly well. And now they've been able to expand their footprint throughout California to take care of patients who might want their expertise with things like lipid disorders, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. Going exactly to the more extreme side from prevention to treatment of very complex anatomic abnormalities. Rahul Sharma, who we're fortunate, who's an Australian who we were fortunate enough to recruit from Cedar Sinai a few years ago. Rahul heads up our structural heart disease program. This is the valve problems, the uh, disorders of myocardial function. And what they really have become is one of the largest programs on the West Coast in dealing with structural abnormalities, whether it be with the aortic valve, the mitral valve, whether it's complex congenital disease, acquired disease, they have a variety of technologies and tricks that previously used to require surgery. We now don't do a fraction of the surgery that we used to do for aortic stenosis because we can replace the valve percutaneous, percutaneously. We're now starting to fix mitral regurgitation percutaneously, just absolutely extraordinary. We've been some of the first centers in the West to, uh, to use some of these complex interventional techniques, new technologies, some of which that are being invented right here in Silicon Valley that we're as part of research studies, being able to understand, can we repair some of these structural abnormalities? No cardiology talk today would be complete if I didn't mention artificial intelligence. And we now know that artificial intelligence applied to large data sets like large collections of EKGs, like large collections of rhythm strips, can actually facilitate how we pick up arrhythmias within populations. And so a lot of work is being done using large um, rhythm strip monitoring databases to begin to learn more about the EKG, 
help us understand how we might predict risk of arrhythmias, but also then as we think about treatments, for example, in the electrophysiology lab, how we might take advantage of that information and apply it to the care of the individual. The Stanford Center of Clinical Research, which is uh, directed by Ken Mahaffey, one of my colleagues who we recruited here to come with us from Duke, now is a research group of over 100 people doing a series of large scale projects around the country um, and, and working with really interesting groups. They're working with the Heart Association. They're working with Apple. Did one of the largest studies ever done with a wearable device where Stanford enrolled over 400,000 subjects to try to understand, could your Apple watch pick up atrial fibrillation? So for those of you who have an Apple watch, like I do, and you know that you can uh, press the heart icon and try to understand whether or not you've had episodes of uh, atrial, uh, likely episodes of atrial fibrillation, all of the work that went into that came from Stanford. Project baseline we talked about. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the other hot areas uh, in cardiology, including wearable devices. I've mentioned the Apple Watch, uh, Mintu Tarakia, who is a, a, a new professor of medicine. I still think of him as a young faculty member. I just became a professor of medicine uh, a couple of months ago, is the leader of our Center for Digital Health here. And Mintu has really done extraordinary work. In this case, work funded largely through the American Heart Association to try to understand blood pressure in sedentary populations. We know that um, inactivity is related or is a risk factor for high blood pressure. So what population here in Silicon Valley did he choose to study? Uber and Lyft drivers who are at increased risk of hypertension because they sit all day and they drive. And so with, uh, with the help of people like Paul Wong and Fatima Rodriguez, uh, Vivek Bala and Tara Chang, both of the last two are from our renal division, they are really interested in, can they use automated tools to measure blood pressure, to aggregate blood pressures in the, uh, in the cloud, bring that information back to medication prescribing and do all of this without any live interface with a clinician. So can we do this all automatically so that our, our colleagues who are driving and who are sedentary for a living, can we help with their blood pressure control and lower their risk of cardiovascular disease? Well, let me finish with what I think ties us back to that American Heart Association focus on health equity is what are we doing here? If, if health equity is a problem in the United States, how are we at Stanford in cardiovascular medicine trying to address those, uh, those problems for tomorrow? We have a large group called the Heart Lab, which stands for Health Equity Advancement Through Research and Technology, which is directed by Fatima Rodriguez, one of our um, young, fantastic assistant professors. She's a health services and outcomes researcher. She's also a preventive cardiologist. And she's interested in the science surrounding health disparities and the science surrounding health equity. But equally important, she's really interested in trying to build the pipeline of investigators. And so she's interested in projects at the Cardiovascular Institute at trying to encourage and mentor women. She's interested in projects of trying to bring the pipeline along, everything from local college students to medical students to residents and fellows, all coming from underrepresented in medicine backgrounds. Says, Can we identify them, use the health equity research projects as a way to engage their attention, teach them about the possibilities of both clinical medicine and research, and can we here at Stanford build our pipeline of young people to help us answer some of these questions regarding health equity, health disparities, and cardiovascular health. So I'll stop with that, Vol, and I hope I've given you a good view of what's going on in the current state of cardiology, and also showed you a little bit about some of the exciting things being done here at Stanford um, that really are future looking, whether we're talking about fancy technologies in the cath lab, wearable devices, uh, con controlling blood pressure without interface with clinicians, all of this is, uh, is exciting stuff and I think is the future of uh, cardiovascular medicine. So thanks for having me and I'm happy to answer questions. 
Terrific, Bob. You know, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation and, and really gave it an overview of all the exciting things that are happening at Stanford. And um, I want to encourage people to um, submit any of their questions. You just need to go down to the bottom of um, the screen right below uh, what you're seeing now with Bob on the screen and um, type in your question and I will try to uh, moderate them for Bob so that he doesn't have to keep track of them. I have a few others that were submitted before the event. So um, here's one uh, for you, Bob. Can you comment about how students, practicing physicians, and the public are taught about plant-based diets and prevention of cardiac disease? How is the information getting out there to them? Yeah, great question. And I would say through multiple sources, certainly, in the educational uh, domain of Stanford Me Medical School, uh, there's classes, there's electives in nutrition as it relates to heart. Um, and certainly people like Christopher Gardner, who is a uh, PhD researcher in the Department of Medicine. He works in a group called the Stanford Prevention Research Center, which some of you may recall was founded by Jack Farku in the 1970s to really understand and study cardiac risk well, that group has a large focus on diet and a large focus on nutrition and how it relates to uh, both heart disease and cancer. Um, so, so that's one avenue. The Stanford Prevention Research uh, Center also offers three educational activities, one of which is that they have an advanced fellowship, uh, NIH-supported T32, where some of these components are taught. Secondly, they have a master's degree in prevention, which undergraduates can then apply for um, here at Stanford and actually, I think, in a five-year program, get a master's degree in prevention. And then finally, they have a PhD program now in prevention um, led by uh, Jody uh, Prashaka, who is a tobacco investigator, but a big portion of the energy in SPRC is on diet nutrition. Terrific. Um Bob, it's been said that in the most recent decades, cardiac survival rates have improved due to the three S's, stents, smoking, and statins. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, what new treatments and technology do you think really are going to be on the forefront? You talked about, well, there's another S, social determinants, but, you know, is it wearables? Is it determinants? Is it, is it, is it is it being able to do surgeries that are non-invasive and, and being able to fix things? What do you, if you were to identify three things like stent smoking and statins that helped us in the 50s and 60s to improve our cardiac health, what now? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say first off, probably the biggest single thing is the public health issues. How do we continue to improve um, smoking uh, rates getting lower and lower, particularly amongst our young people? There's going to be major debates coming in the, uh, in the next year or two ahead around the FDA's regulation of tobacco products, including things like e-cigarettes, things like menthol cigarettes. So the public health focus is going to make, continue to make a huge impact. And so thank you for highlighting the smoking in the past. On the interventional front, you know, you, you talked about stents. I came of age in the early, as an interventional cardiologist in the early days of stenting. During my fellowship stents were an experimental device. And uh, over the course of my fellowship, I put in a handful of stents. Within a couple of years of joining the, the Duke faculty at the time, I was putting in hundreds of coronary stents and that absolutely changed the game for people suffering from heart attacks. Likewise, um, statins were just coming onto the scene with the big outcome studies as I was a resident and a fellow. And now those drugs, as you've indicated, are almost ubiquitous. I think that what you're gonna see is that in interventional cardiology, the focus on structural heart disease and heart failure, the focus on not just transplant, but some of the advanced um, left ventricular assist devices are gonna make huge impact. And then when we get to drugs, I think what you're gonna increasingly see is a bit more of like what's been done in cancer, real precision-based medications. Uh, we're seeing this, for example, in the genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathies with new drugs to help the ventricle relax. You're going to see it. One of our um, Stanford faculty members 
uh, Nick Leeper, in collaboration with a very senior Stanford faculty member, Irv Weissman, are now taking the lessons that they've learned with, um, with cancer biology and applying that to uh, atherosclerosis and trying to understand, can some of the same mechanisms that you could interfere with cancer, can you again prevent or even regress the uh, atherosclerosis? So science driving precision therapies, new structural and, um, and device-based techniques and public health, Jennifer, are the three things I would say as uh, moving cardiovascular health forward. One of our viewers also um, mentioned, and I'm gonna, this is jargon to me, so SGLT1 inhibitors as a fourth S. Can you explain that to the audience and whether that, what's, what that's about? Yeah, these are the sodium glucose transporter inhibitors that were um, developed as a, uh, as a way to treat diabetes. Essentially what these drugs do is they make you pee out glucose. They're glucosuresis. And here's a great example of unintended consequences. Uh, more than about maybe 14, 15 years ago, the FDA in looking at diabetic medications said, okay, we know it's important that these medications lower glucose, but equally important is that they not do harm because there were some indications that some diabetes medicines while lowering glucose actually increased the risk of things like heart attacks and stroke. So the FDA actually, after con con consultation with the academic community, the clinical community, the patient community, uh, put forward recommendations for regulations uh, so-called draft guidance documents, where they said, if you're gonna develop a new diabetes drug, you have to do a study large enough to show us that there's not excessive harm. Well, guess what happened with the SGLT2 inhibitors? It wasn't just that they showed there was no harm. They actually showed that there was benefit. That then over the course of the last seven or eight years has set off this explosion of clinical trials to try to understand the benefits of the SGLT2 inhibitors. There's no question they're saving lives in heart failure. They're saving lives in chronic kidney disease. Um, they're being looked at as an adjunct in coronary artery disease, things like myoclonal infarction. Uh, these drugs have really become foundational therapies now. And uh, it came about because of a change in regulatory practice. We might never have observed that because while people have hypotheses, as to why these drugs might be associated with an improvement in mortality. Uh, we don't actually know the mechanisms. And uh, that's gonna be a lot of field of investigation in the coming years ahead. So thanks for bringing that up. Yes, those drugs are becoming foundational therapy. Great. Could you comment on the collaboration and cooperation of cardiology and radiology with regards to advances in cardiac imagery and treatment? Yeah, the, 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 I know where the, that came from. <laughs> <laughs> that had to have come from my radiology colleague. Um, uh -huh. this, this is an incredibly exciting time to have this uh, conversation. If you think about it, cardiologists, we're one of the specialties um, where imaging is really important to the everyday practice of what we do. Whether we're talking about cardiac ultrasound, echo, we're talking about what I do, angiography, um, or now we're talking about the advanced imaging techniques of cardiac CT and cardiac MRI. It's really the radiologists who have been the imaging experts with the cardiologists who have been the clinical disease expert and how you might apply it. And so of all, I think that th this is the perfect time to bring the two disciplines together. And you know that if you look around the country, um, there's three things happening. One is that um, radiologists and cardiologists are just going about their business doing their own thing. The second is that they're at places where they can't settle for doing their own thing, so they're fighting all the time about who does what. The third is when they say, oh, we're in different disciplines which are actually complementary to each other, let's bring them together. Now guess which ones have the best cardiovascular imaging programs in the country? Ding, ding, ding. Number three is that when cardiologists and radiologists work together, particularly with regard to CT and MR, 
Um, that's where the best science is being done. And so, as you know, Vol, um, we were fortunate here to have a great cardiovascular imaging. And now we're a place where echo really was invented by Rich Pop and others. But now we just recruited Mike Salerno from UVA to be Vol's counterpart on the cardiovascular side. So yeah, I'm, I'm like really bullish on this for the next, you know, the next period of years. I think if we can get our cardiologists and our radiologists to do science together, which every indication is we can, um, I, think, I think Stanford could become an epicenter of cardiovascular imaging, which is where the field is going. Yeah, I mean, symbiosis. I mean, it really is it's just a, a wonderful relationship after having come from private practice where, you know, there was a lot of butting in heads and, you know, what's, my, you know, what's mine, and what's yours and how to get more for me. Uh, it's, it really is heartening to see how people are working together. And, and uh, you know, obviously we're working for the benefit of the patient. And I think that's the best way of doing it. So we, we have the, the best of both worlds here, I think. I, I completely agree with you. I mean, take, take something like uh, myocarditis, which really in some cases requires very sophisticated imaging with cardiac MR to be able to understand, do you have cardiac inflammation? And even if you see something on the MRI, are you really seeing something that's, that's pathologic? And that's where I think bringing the imagers and the clinicians together is critically, the cardiac clinicians together is critically important. You know, what are their biomarkers? Did you see anything on the EKG? That's where I think the action's gonna come. Terrific, thank you. Um, here's another question that it, it's a little, little more specific than, than I understand, but, um, you did talk about Irv Weissman and some of his work in stem cell, um, particularly for cancer treatment, and um, that there's some learnings to be had there for, for cardiology as well. Um, there's a question here about stem cell availability to treat small fiber neuropathy, lower leg and foot, and, and other things that are related to heart disease. Yeah, so great question. A little bit out of my area of expertise. I, I will say that... Um, uh, neurosurgery here, largely led by Gary Steinberg, the long-term uh, chair of neurosurgery until a couple of years ago, Gary has been very interested in, um, in stem cells uh, for the healing of stroke and, uh, and brain damage that way. I don't actually know if they're using it in the periphery. Clearly a lot of interest here at Stanford in using it centrally for people who have suffered stroke. And with some really interesting um, uh, early outcomes and a lot of investigation going on in that area. So for sure in large, um, large strokes, et cetera, and uh, I suspect in neuropathies, but I, I don't know the exact answer to that. Okay. So recently there was uh, quite a bit of press and flurry around transplanting a pig's heart into a human. <laughs> What's the outlook for organ transplants and will they become common or is, is the focus really on prevention and treatment of, uh, rather than transplant? I was on a panel yesterday at a, this is heart month, by the way, February. And so we all celebrate heart month. I hope some of you even wore red on Friday when we had our go red day. You'll see in my lapel here, I have a red dress and that's the HA's. Uh, campaign Go Red for Women that we've been, it's been going on now about 18 years to try to raise awareness of heart disease in women. And I was on a panel with Eldrin Lewis yesterday, who's our new chief of cardiovascular medicine, came here from the Brigham. He's an advanced heart failure specialist. And Jennifer, he mentioned that there are about 400,000 people in the U.S. suffering with heart failure. And we only do about 4,000 heart transplants a year. So clearly transplant by itself in the current configuration of how we do it is not offering up um, solutions for the vast, vast majority of the people who have heart failure. So to, to your question, I think that there will be study and the xenotransplant, the, uh, the pig transplant issue may well be part of the answer for transplantation. It definitely increases the potential supply of organs. There's still a lot we have to understand about how one shuts off the immune issues. Um, a lot of things that have to go into understanding the durability of that, et cetera, but nonetheless exciting. And I think it may well be you know, part of the answer. 
we have to figure out um, in mechanical assist devices um, how we might create technologies that are uh, serving as an artificial circulation, the so-called left assist, ventricular assist devices. Again, not the answer for everybody, but an important answer. I mentioned stem cells that Joe Wu is working on. That may be another part of the answer. And then finally, a lot of new exciting medications about not just stabilizing the heart, but potentially restoring heart function. And that's very exciting. But even as you get all of that, it's still 400,000 individuals. We have got to do a better job preventing uh, heart failure and the two leading causes of heart failure that we need that we have good therapies today that we can start to work on for prevention are hypertension and myocardial infarction, heart attacks. Uh, and heart attacks come from atherosclerosis. So again, going back to those public health messages about tobacco and cholesterol and glucose and regular exercise and good diets, all important part of prevention, lower blood pressure, reduce the risk of heart attacks, that reduces the risk of, uh, of heart failure. So. Prevention, 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 technology, and new medicines. Um, so you talked a little bit about, you know, some of the medicines and the, and the side effects, and it turned out when you studied it, they were actually positive rather than negative. Um, but where, where is the role of personalized medicine in, in things like concerns about heart damage from chemotherapies, for example? Um, Boy, that's a great question. Um, one of the things we're trying to figure out, and I use we there very liberally, people like Hanzu are trying to figure out, are, um, are there genetic signatures, for example, that might predict the risk of an adverse response to, uh, to, certain chemo, to a certain uh, immunotherapy that would affect the heart? So yeah, whoever asked the question, that's spot on. We are trying to figure out, can we identify people who might have an adverse reaction to something like a checkpoint, an immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, that you might actually dose it differently. You might give it at a different schedule. You might not give it at all. You might use a different methodology uh, or you might give another drug to try to counterbalance that um, with the heart side effects. So yeah, I think that's an important part of the future. That's exactly what people like Han are trying to do. All right. As you look back on the course of your career, what, what most surprised you about, you know, what you thought you were getting into in cardiology and, and what has happened in the space of time just in your career? So I got interested in cardiology in the 80s because I was interested in blood clotting. And I actually thought I was going to be a hematologist. I was working in a hematologist lab while I was doing my residency. I was really fascinated. Uh, some of you will probably cringe when I say this. I was fascinated by things like the coagulation cascade and the way that platelets came together to form a platelet aggregate and blood clots were formed on the basis of that. And I, that's what I thought I was going to do. And the hematologist that I was working at with at UMass at the time said, Bob, the action in thrombosis is going to be in cardiology. And because we're moving from the venous side of the circulation to the arterial side, and what a time. He, he was so spot on. It was just literally around that time in the early 80s that it was definitively shown that heart attacks were caused by a blood clot. Think about that. That's in the course of my career that we really understood that heart attacks were caused by blood clots. And that just unleashed, Jennifer, a whole series of, uh, of new discoveries around platelet inhibitors and thrombin inhibitors and factor 10 inhibitors. Now I'm, I'm working on new anticoagulants with uh, factor 11 inhibitors that are really changing the game. And um, so the, the thing that excites me that changed dramatically, when I was an intern, if you had a heart attack, the likelihood of you dying in the first month was about one in five, about 20% of people died. Those are people that made it to the hospital, they died. Now, fast forward, I'm not an intern anymore. It's been a few years, but now it's about one in 20, it's about 5%. And so that's largely because of all the 
progress in technology and stenting and statins and blood thinners and platelet inhibitors, rapid reperfusion, all of the stuff that we've done now for the last 35 plus years has really translated. And to me, that says, what surprised me, Jennifer, is that it takes a long time. Uh, the progress is slow. Uh, but what excites me is that it's been progress. I mean, again, and I like to think I'm not that old, but in the course of my career, I've, I've seen the risk of dying from a heart attack go from one to one in five to now one in 20. And that's pretty exciting. Wow. So this is the last question that we have time for. Um, talk, you, you, you talked a lot about wonderful things that are happening at Stanford Medicine, but what is it about Stanford Medicine and how it is structured um, with the collaborations on campus or collaborations within the School of Medicine and the hospitals? What is it that really allows you and your colleagues to advance your research and translate discoveries into actual treatments? What's different about Stanford? Oh, uh, well, Vol had said at the beginning that I'm a native New Englander and my accent when I say things like heart attack and my confraction probably gives it away. Um, <laughs> but Jennifer, this place is, as we would say in Boston, this place is wicked awesome. Uh, what's so great about Stanford, and this goes back to the, as I understand the history, when the school moved down from the, sit, from the city to campus, is that there is this spirit of collegiality and collaboration that is critical for team-based science. And some of my, you know, people that you all on the phone know uh, were the people who really did team-based science, the radiation oncologists who work with the physicists and the clinical oncologists. Um, that doesn't happen everywhere, but Stanford has an environment where collegiality and collaboration for problem solving is, uh, is really held as an institutional value. And I can tell you that as a department chair, I have members in my department who literally work all over campus. They work in arts and sciences. They work in the law school. They work in the business school. They work um, in the various institutes on campus. And in virtually all of those places, those people have secondary appointments in the Department of Medicine. And so that's unusual with all that movement back and forth, all that crosstalk. And um, I think it's really one of the great, great things about Stanford is the ability and the encouragement to work across disciplines to solve big problems. I, I like to say when I'm trying to make the Stanford pitch to medical students to come here for internship, residency, fellowship, that um, you can think big at Stanford because Stanford likes to tackle big problems and uh, is willing to tackle big problems but you can only tackle big problems with teams. And, uh, and Stanford is really good at that. Stanford's also not shy about reaching out to Silicon Valley for help and uh, in bringing technologies in or pushing our technologies out when they're ready, for example, to, uh, to think about commercialization. And that fluidity between the Valley and campus, I think is also really important part of, uh, of driving progress on the medical side of things anyways. That's, that's terrific, Bob. Uh, thank you so much for your insights today and for your presentation, for answering these questions. I know that um, many of us have other questions. You know, I love the fact that I can look at my Apple Watch and, and, and get my heart rhythm. Yeah, uh, press the little red button. You wrote little red I, heart. In 30 seconds, I can outdo the people, the, the technician on the EKG machine. So, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful to, to share in all the, the work that's being done at Stanford and your leadership in those uh, departments and, and what you do for Stanford and what you do for students. I know many of you don't realize that Bob has been a continual supporter of our first generation mentoring program that the association helped sponsor, um, bringing up young, young people um, who um, are, are really contributing a lot to where medicine is gonna go in the future. So we thank you, Bob, for your presentation and for Vol, um, for your uh, participation today. There, uh, we will have a recording of this event that we will post within the next week on our website. And you can just Google in Stanford Medicine Alumni Association, or you can go to med.stanford.edu slash alumni. Um, to find out more about other programs that are happening. Um, 
We um, are also sending out a survey to all of you so that we can get your feedback on today's events. It always helps us as we improve our programs going forward. We hope to see you at other programs. Our upcoming alumni day is planned to be in person on campus and we will be um, looking at some of the discoveries in the area of cancer, but also um, having our class reunions and that's on April 9th of, of this year. Again, go to our website and you can find out more information about our many speakers and presentations for that event. Jennifer, could I add just uh, two things really quickly? One sure. is to th thank the staff for setting this up. You and Elgin and Jennifer uh, uh, and Anthony, uh, thank you so very much for doing this. And uh, special thanks to Bob. Bob, uh, my, my myocardium rests easy knowing you're right down the hall. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and to quote you or turn the quote around, you are wicked awesome. We really appreciate you. Thank you so very much for what you've done for the school. Uh, and it's 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 great to be uh, great to be your colleague. So thank you, thank you, and thank for you for today. Me. Thank you. So um, as as we end this portion of our program, um, you know that the fortunate thing is that we've planned a little um, conversation time with with those of you that can stay on. Um, the complicating factor is that we have to have you jump out of this particular Zoom meeting. And uh, to do that, we've made it um, hopefully simple. If you go down and click on your bottom column at chat, um, then you will see in chat a message from Anthony Lee, our host. Um, and he will, uh, all you have to do is click on that and it's gonna jump you right into our conversation hour. Um, and for those that can join us, great. For those who cannot, we thank you for joining us today. We thank you for um, being part of Stanford's legacy. And uh, we hope to see you at, at future programs as well as at next year's Half Century event. Thank you all. And just go over and click onto that, uh, that link. Just kind of tap it with the arrow and that'll move you over. Thanks again, Night. everyone.